This is the Metropolitan Tabernacle, the church in London where Charles Spurgeon preached. In building a powerful ministry, Spurgeon modeled the principles that Paul taught. Timothy was told, all scripture is sufficient for all things, so preach the word. Our study of the pastoral letters from Paul to Timothy make up our flight plan in this segment of the Bible from 30,000 feet. There's no better place than at the Church of the Prince of Preachers to introduce these studies. So now, let's get these final instructions. Our journey over scripture takes a new turn as pastoral epistles will now come clearly into view in our flight over the Bible from 30,000 feet. And open your Bibles tonight to 1st and 2nd Timothy. Those are the two books we will cover tonight, 1st and 2nd Timothy. Now we're almost done with the Bible from 30,000 feet. Next week we'll look at the book of Titus and Philemon. The following week we'll look at the book of Hebrews. After that we'll be in James and then 1st and 2nd Peter. And then John, 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John, Jude. Some of those are short. We'll just do it in one fell swoop. And then the book of Revelation. And we have landed the plane by that time. So we're coming to an end. It's been, for me, very fruitful. I've really enjoyed it. And here's why. I've taught through the Bible here at this church twice. And last time I went through verse by verse, every verse of every book, it took me like 11 or 12 years. So to go through it, even though it's been a flyover, in just a little over a year, this is like week 56, um, it's pretty satisfying to see it all come together. And, and um, I've especially appreciated the hunger and the thirst that I see in, in, with all of you guys. You know, I come into the foyer sometimes early and I see you hovering over the note table. It's like, what notes did I miss from the past? I got to get those notes. And it just shows hungry hearts. And can I just say as a pastor how wonderful and even rare it is to be able to preach and teach to a group of people who are as hungry for truth as you are. It's an absolute pleasure. So let's pray tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that this time of our service tonight is part of our worship. We are demonstrating by our attention to the word of God that what you say is worth listening to that it's not worth being distracted from. You have our full attention. We want to understand the message that you gave through your servant Paul. Though it was addressed to young Timothy, it really speaks to anyone in leadership in the church today. So help us to understand it. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. First Timothy, Second Timothy, and Titus are in a little special section all their own called the pastoral epistles because Paul writes personal letters to these two young pastors that he leaves to their ministry. Now Paul was at Ephesus for about three years. When he left, he put Timothy there. So Timothy, whom Paul says is my own son in the faith, he left in Ephesus. And he leaves Titus in Crete to take over the church there and raise up leadership. Now, First and Second Timothy are two books that every pastor loves, or I should say every pastor should love, because it's the first detailed description of how the church operates in the New Testament. If we want to know what it's to be like, this tells you in detail what it is to be like. It talks about the call to the ministry, the qualifications for the ministry, and the care of the minister toward those who need that care in the congregations. Now, the first book, 1 Timothy, has a theme that is readily seen. It's stated. We don't have to guess the purpose of this book. He writes in chapter 3, verse 15, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. So he states in one verse the purpose for writing this first letter. A little bit about Timothy. Timothy was important to Paul. 24 times in Paul's writings he will refer to Timothy. Timothy was a son in the faith, as I said, because he led him to Christ. 
He was also a, a protege of the apostle. Now, this is how it worked. When Paul was on his first missionary journey, and he went through Lystra and Derbe and Iconium in a little section where he got stoned. I mean, didn't get stoned. They threw rocks at him, and he got kicked out of the city. When he was in that first city, Lystra, that's where Timothy lived with his mother and grandmother and his father. Now, Timothy's mother was a believer. She was Jewish, and she believed that Yeshua was the Messiah. Jesus was Christ. His father was a Greek and seems that he was an unbeliever, so he was born of mixed parentage. He heard the gospel on Paul's first trip through his hometown, and probably through hearing Paul and the influence of his mother and grandmother, he came to Christ, so that years later on Paul's second missionary journey, Timothy joined Paul the Apostle Evangelistic Association, and he went on that tour with Paul. And he became so important to the apostle that Paul designates him with a very unique term. In the book of Philippians, if you remember this, he said concerning Timothy, For I have no one like-minded who will naturally care for your state. Remember that little text? Like-minded. Esopsukos is one Greek word. Equal-souled. Equal-souled. We are like bread and butter. We track. Our minds, our hearts are in sync. We are equal sold. And it's a very unique term used only once in the New Testament, and that's the only time Paul uses it is to refer to Timothy. So Timothy goes with Paul on the first missionary journey. Later on, Timothy will accompany Paul with a collection of money that they bring back to the church in Jerusalem. And then much later on, he will go to Ephesus and take over pastoral duties in Ephesus, dealing with false teachers and appointing spiritual leaders. So when we read 1 Timothy, we're reading a letter from the apostle to the pastor of the church of Ephesus. That's where he was located at this time. So this talks to us tonight about the church and its leadership, 1 and 2 Timothy. Now today, people have lots of options for churches. And people go, let's call it church shopping. They have a little sort of list in their mind of ingredients that they want to fulfill. I want this in a church and that in a church and this in a church and that in a church. And we have that option today. It's wonderful. Back then, you were lucky if you had an assembly in a town within miles of anywhere, and that was it. But today, people look for ingredients that they want And the trouble is, we ought to be consulting the founder and the director of the church himself, Jesus Christ. He said, I will build my church. So in finding a church, one should certainly be looking for one that Jesus is the founder of and is following the principles as outlined in these pastoral epistles. So let me just pose a question to you personally before we jump in. Here's the question. I always like to ask it from time to time, especially when people are looking around for churches or, well, this church isn't very this or very that. If everyone in your church were just like you, what kind of church would it be? So if that's just cogitate on that, mull over that for a lifetime, and (laughs) it's very helpful, I find. There's six chapters in 1 Timothy, four chapters in 2 Timothy. I'm going to give you the outline, not of 2 Timothy right yet, but just 1 Timothy. Six chapters, four main divisions. First of all, chapter 1, the message of the church. The message of the church, the truth, the gospel, the core message of the church. Chapters 2 and 3, the members of the church. Different kinds of people that make up an assembly. Chapter 4, the minister or ministers of the church. And chapters 5 and 6, the ministry of the church. That forms the division. Let's consider a few verses in chapter 1. The message of the church. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. To Timothy a true son in the faith. See that little phrase, the faith? 
There is only one true faith. And when Paul uses the term the faith, as Jude will later use the term the faith, it means the body of revealed truth that the church believes and holds to. The gospel truth. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I urged you when I was in Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Now one of the words you're going to notice Paul liked a lot, especially in these two letters, is the word doctrine. And when he uses the two words other doctrine, though it's two words in English, it's one word in the original language. It's heterodidaskalos, a different teaching, a different gospel, something that people hold to other than the faith, the truth that we have revealed. That's what he writes about here. Nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in the faith. So what people were doing, we can piece together, and we've seen this in other letters, so we're used to it by now. There were Gnostics, and there were mystics, and they added stories and myths to biblical stories. So pretty soon, it was hard to tell what is an actual historical Old Testament narrative versus some myth. Plus, remember, the Gnostics believed in the doctrine of emanations, that God is too pure and holy and righteous to touch anything in the physical world so that God, the God, never created the earth, never created anything physical because he's spiritual and that which is spiritual would never defile himself with anything physical. So an emanation went out from God and another emanation and another emanation and another emanation from that emanation. And eventually there was an emanation that went out from God that was so far removed from God that that emanation created the earth. That was their wacky doctrine. It was all made up, all made up. That's what Paul is writing against here. Verse 18, this charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. A lot of Christians today do not know that we are in a war for the truth, a battle for the truth. Wage the good warfare. Warfare. What was it that Jude said in his little epistle, verse 3? Contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Did you hear that? Contend. You know what that means? Contentious. Put up a good fight for the faith. Somebody says something false, you can just, well, you know, it's what you believe. That's your truth. Or you can say, excuse me, but that's not the truth. And Of course, he's writing in the context of the church, of all places we need to guard the truth, it would be here, the faith, the truth, what is revealed. Now look at chapter 2. We get to the second section, the members of the church, men, women, pastors, deacons, several groups are listed. Verse 1, therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, that would be strong entreaties, prayers a general word, intercessions, praying on behalf of someone else, and giving of thanks be made for all men, notice, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth." He didn't say pray for people who agree with your political position, Uh, pray for leaders who are sympathetic toward Christian ideologies, but pray for all men and all who are in authority. You know, as Christians, we are, we have a dual citizenship. Uh, Paul said in Philippians, our citizenship is in heaven. We ought to be looking toward that and thinking about that and dwelling on that. He said, at the same time, We must be responsible citizens of the earth. And we ought to be obeying the laws of the land and praying for those who govern. When Jesus looked into the future and saw his people on the earth, 
If you remember, he prayed, Father, I do not pray that you would take them out of the world, but that you would deliver them from the evil one. So it's clear that he wants us in the world, but not of the world. Don't, I pray, take them out of the world. Now, when we pray, our prayer is, take me out of this world. Get me out of this place. Give me a, a group of people that are, are, I can surround myself with that all love Jesus. And, and, and that will be nice. It's called heaven, by the way. When you get there, you'll know the difference. But until then, we were meant to be salt and light here. Now, when Paul wrote this, the guy in charge was Caesar Nero. Doesn't get much worse than that. He hated Christians. And right about, well, a little bit after this time, around 64 AD, he kind of amped up the persecution so that uh, they often dealt with leaders who were hostile toward the faith. And Paul says, don't write them off. God desires all men to be saved. Of course, in context, he's including those hostile leaders. Pray that God would save Nero. Pray that God would save those people that you didn't vote for or you disagree with. We're to pray for all men. Verse 8, I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, The idea here is men are to lead in the public worship of the church. A common posture for prayer is to raise the hands. I remember the first time I walked into a Christian assembly and I saw people raising their hands. I wasn't raised in a church that had any kind of open public display of worship. You know, you go to church, you just sort of sit there and you just kind of look around, you don't say anything, and then you leave, but there's just kind of, that's it. But I saw people during times of worship with their hands raised, and I thought, that's weird, that's spooky. I'll never do that. It's such a wonderful posture of surrender. Because it's like if uh, somebody holds you up, they might point a gun at you and say, put your hands up. Your hands are up, you can't do anything with them. You're helpless to do anything. You can't text (laughs) when your hands are up. You can't work on another project while your hands are up. It's I surrender. Now, it's not like you have to raise your hands when you worship. You certainly can, and it's certainly appropriate in the Bible. Um, I've often thought it's actually weirder not to raise your hands when you sing, I lift my hands up to you, Lord. I, I raise my hands, and a lot of times I'll look around, and we sing that, and you're singing it, but you're not doing it. So I'd say, either do it or, or don't say that you're doing it when you're not doing it. It just sort of makes sense. At least kind of take your cues from the song. <laughs> in like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Now this is the church he's speaking about. He's not saying that it's wrong to wear jewelry or it's wrong to do your hair up or it's wrong to wear makeup or it's wrong to wear certain fashions. Nothing wrong with that. But church isn't to be a fashion show. That's why I love the fact that we can come in our jeans if we want to. If you want to dress up, great. But it's not about what you wear or how you look. And may I just please at this point use this text to give a plea to young women to dress modestly for the sake of your Christian brothers who who are around you. Now, I know, I know that Jesus said to men, whoever looks upon another woman to lust for her in his heart has committed adultery. And that is true. That is a problem. But there's another side to that problem. You see, if there wasn't Bathsheba bathing on the roof of her house, it'd be a lot more helpful for David when he walks outside. There's two sides to that coin. And women can dress in such a way as to invite male attention and incite their lustful gratification. So don't do it. Don't give the opportunity. Arthur W. Pink writes this. 
If lustful looking is so grievous a sin, then those who dress and expose themselves with a desire to be looked at and lusted after are not less, but perhaps more guilty. In this matter, it is not only too often the case that men sin, but women tempt them to do so. How great, then, must be the guilt of a great majority of modern misses who deliberately seek to arouse the sexual passions of young men. So it's not about you. It's not about how you look. It's about God and about worshiping him. And so that's the focus and that's the emphasis Paul is giving. Now chapter 3 and 4 of 1 Timothy brings us to the third section of this epistle, this letter. The ministers of the church are addressed. Verse 1, this is a faithful saying. If a man desires the position of a bishop, bishop means an overseer or an elder or a pastor, those terms are often used interchangeably in the New Testament to speak of the same office. He desires a good work. Now the bishop, the overseer, the elder, the pastor, this was the principal office in the New Testament church. He had help. We'll read about the deacons in a minute. But uh, now he lists 16 qualifications uh, for the pastor. And look it down at verse 8. Likewise, deacons, they're part of the same ministry group. Deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money. By the way, it's there to be reverent, not reverend. Okay, so I just want to make a little point here. The Bible never uses the term reverend so-and-so when speaking of a minister. I know we do that. And it's just, it's part of our culture. It's not going to change. But if you look up the word reverend, the only time I found that it applies to anyone in the Bible is to God. Reverend and holy is the Lord. He is to be revered. So I just, when people call me reverend, I just sort of, I don't, I kind of like want to move away or something or no. I mean, it doesn't even sound right, does it? Reverend Skip. Those two words don't match. If I had maybe a cooler name that was more reverend, it would work. But we are to be reverent. We are to live in such a way, both elders and deacons, that are reverent in behavior. So likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, and a list of qualifications is given now to the deacons. Now, let me tell you what a deacon is. The word, the idea of this, uh, appears first in the book of Acts, in chapter 2, where the apostles say, we're not going to leave the word of God and serve tables. Diakonia is the word for serve or servant. Diakonia, deacon. Sometimes... The word refers to a specific office. Oftentimes, the word simply refers to anybody who serves in the local assembly of the church. A servant of God is a deacon, one who serves. When it's used in the official sense, it's those who help the elders fulfill their spiritual ministry. Chapter 4 continues the, the ministers of the church theme. And he's going to warn of those who will fall away from the truth and the need to warn them and the need to teach the truth. Look at verse 6. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine. There's that word again. Which you have carefully followed. Now, let me just tell you what he's getting at. He's speaking of the need to continually feed and be nourished with the everlasting truth of the Word of God. And the need is especially needful for those in the ministry. Sometimes people can be ministering to other people and writing sermons and preparing Bible studies, and every time they read the Bible, they're thinking about their audience rather than what God's trying to personally show me. And it has to be applied, first of all, to oneself, That's the idea of that verse that we just read. Verse 13, till I come, give attention to reading. Well, we're doing that. Exhortation, we're doing that. And to doctrine, we're doing that. Verse 16, take heed to yourself, Timothy, 
and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Now, I mentioned that doctrine is used quite a bit. Twenty times, Paul himself uses the term in his writings. Twenty times, doctrine. Thirty-seven times, it's used in the Bible. Doctrine, 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 doctrine. But Paul uses it twenty times. Didascalia. It means teaching, truth, instruction. Now, if I ever felt sorry for a word in a language, I feel sorry for the little word doctrine. I feel sorry because of the way I hear Christians talk about doctrine. Conversations like this. Well, dude, I don't want to talk about doctrine, man. I just want to talk about Jesus. Ooh, that sounds so cool and so hip and so spiritual. It's just flat out wrong. Well, you know, doctrine, that's just like technical stuff. I'm just into God. Listen, doctrine just means healthy, good, solid teaching. So listen to how it sounds. I'm not into good, solid, healthy teaching, man. You're not? Shame on you. You should be. Because you wouldn't know anything, and I wouldn't know anything about Jesus and God and what to do were it not for the teaching, the doctrine, the instruction that comes from the Bible. Now, when I buy a gadget, I hate the manual. Because sometimes the manual is like four times bigger than the gadget. It's like a dictionary. It's like this huge volume. And it's like, oh, there's no way I'm going to read this. I'm just going to intuit it. I'm going to figure this thing out. And if I get stuck, I'll call somebody who has one of these little gadgets. I'm not going to look at this book. And that's my concern. My concern is that as Christians, as Christian churches in this modern age, we're neglecting the owner's manual. And churches now, the trend now is to say, well, preaching is too authoritarian and we should just have discussions and we shouldn't say, thus says the Lord, or anything is absolutely true. And there's a movement away from the truth. And so today, it's more important about what you feel rather than what you know to be true. Honestly. Well, how does it make you feel? Well, that's good. But objective truth has been cast out. So people today are, are long on zeal and short on facts. And yet, what did the prophet Hosea say? What did God say through the prophet Hosea? My people perish for lack of feeling. Oh, my people perish for lack of inner warmth. No, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Four times I've counted at least, maybe more, Jesus said to the leaders of his day, have you not read? Have you not read? Like, you should know this. It's there in the book. It's right there. This is what God said. We can apply it to our lives. James Montgomery Boyce, who's now in heaven, one of my favorite authors, wrote, we do not have a strong church today, nor do we have many strong Christians we can trace this cause to an acute lack of sound spiritual knowledge. Ask the average Christian to talk about God. And after getting past the expected answers, you'll find that his God is a little God of vacillating sentiments. Now, as a pastor, here's my goal. I would love and my aim weekly what I live for is to make sure you are the best fed and best loved congregation on the planet. I want you to know the Bible. I want you to know spiritual truth. I want you to know the will of God. And the more you're exposed to the truth and the more I'm exposed to the truth, we're going to grow in the knowledge of the will of God. And if I'm going to leave any legacy, it's that of a biblically literate I pray, congregation who loves the truth, and I already see it in you, and I thank God for that. Now, let's look at, finally, chapter 5 and 6, the ministry of the church, the ministry. And this is a little section on how to handle all the different kinds of people that gather together, old people, young people, truth seekers, false teachers. Well, it sounds like a Dylan song. I oh, forget it. I'm thinking of a, I'm thinking of something. 
I'm thinking of a song actually that he wrote that has a little rhyme in it, but you don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. Verse 1, do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women, etc. Verse 3, honor widows who are really widows. Now chapter 5, verse 3 through 16 are a list of what qualifies a widow to receive help, physical, monetary help from the church. They wouldn't give money to anybody. If they were a widow who had no family, no other means of support, husband died, no children, no relatives, then, under certain circumstances, the church at large would take care of them. And those are spelled out here. Verse 17, let the elders who rule well be counted of worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. Verse 19, do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all that the rest may also fear. So all these different kinds of people and how they're to be dealt with in the church and that little verse, that last verse, verse 20, you don't see that done very often. Those who are sinning rebuke in the presence of all. And it's very rarely done. I think we've done it maybe twice here in the whole history of the church where we've had to bring, some, not bring somebody up, but say what happened because the sin was a public sin and had to be dealt with in that kind of a fashion. The early church, it was done quite regularly. And I'll tell you what this did. It brought the fear of God upon people. Because if sinning in such a way as to damage the church would be dealt with publicly in front of that congregation, you'd have people go, okay, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to do that. Now today, when people say, well, you do that, I'm just going to go to another church. Back then, they didn't have another church. You were kicked out of the church. You were out of the church. But today, now people would circumvent this. Let's go to chapter 6, verse 1, continuing about the ministry of the church to various people. Let as many bond servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed. And those who have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but rather serve them because those who are benefited are believers and beloved. Teach and exhort these things. Now this to me is very enlightening, very interesting. This is one of the six times that the New Testament speaks about master slavery relationships were very common 2,000 years ago. It's written about in 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, Colossians, Titus, Timothy, and Philemon. When we get to Philemon next week, we'll uh, expand more on that. But 2,000 years ago, slavery was an established legal institution in the Roman government. In fact, it is believed that 60 million people were slaves 2,000 years ago in the Roman Empire. That's half the population of the Roman Empire. Now, when I talk about those kind of slaves, let me tell you what they were like. Some was menial labor, but many of them were well-to-do, very educated, given a lot of responsibility, hired or brought into the employ of some kind a mastership of a very wealthy family. They would be teachers. They would be private tutors. They would sometimes be doctors. It is believed that Luke, who was a physician, was a slave owned by Theophilus. That's why he wrote to Theophilus. That was his job to gather the facts. So they had very reputable positions. And what's interesting to me about all of these different situations is that Paul, John, Peter, none of them ever spoke out against slavery. Isn't that interesting? There's never an attempt to overturn it or abolish it. But simply understanding that culture back then, and I'm sure Paul didn't think he's going to rid the Roman Empire of 60 million slaves. So he wanted to mitigate against the problems. And the church does that. I'll explain why in a minute. So what he basically tells slaves to do is be the best slave in the batch. Be such a good slave, such a godly slave, such an obedient slave 
that the master would even be won to Christ by his servitude. It's a very, very interesting approach. Now, the church was common ground. If you went to an assembly 2,000 years ago, you'd have slaves and masters sitting next to each other. In fact, at Colossae, Philemon and his slave Onesimus, who was a runaway slave, and next week we'll see what that meant for him to come back, were together. This created some tension because Christianity taught 2,000 years ago, whether you're a master or a slave, with Christ, you're exactly the same. You're all equal. No one's greater, no one's less. And that was true, and they all came together in the assembly. In fact, 2,000 years ago in a New Testament assembly, there might be a slave who was an elder and a master who was not. So the roles are reversed in terms of who is esteemed, etc. Very interesting. It did create some problems because Galatians 3.28 teaches, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, you are all one in Christ. So you come together as a church, all the barriers are loose, they're gone. But I'm not going to overturn this thing in the Roman Empire, so if you are in that situation, slaves, you be the best slave possible. Masters, you treat your slaves with respect like any employee. In verse 20, O Timothy, guard what was committed to your trust, that is the truth, the word of God, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and the contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge by professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. Grace be with you. Amen. Now it says grace be with you. It's plural. It's grace be with y'all. So while this is a letter to Timothy, the very end, he's kind of saying, tell everybody at the church that I ministered at for three years in Ephesus, my greetings. So Timothy, like every minister, was to guard like a sacred trust, truth, and stand up for the truth, and fight for the truth, and warn with the truth, and exhort with the truth, and teach the truth. That's the theme of 1 Timothy. Now let's look at 2 Timothy, and we'll close. 2 Timothy is the last letter Paul ever wrote. After 2 Timothy, he died. That's the belief. It is his swan song. I think he knew he was coming toward an end because he says that toward the end of his letter. Now, there's quite a difference in tone from 1 and 2 Timothy. In 1 Timothy... There's an anticipation. Timothy feels, I'm going to get, re- or Paul feels, I'm going to get released from prison soon, and Timothy, I'm going, to, I'm going to join you. We'll be together again. Not in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, he's resigned to the fact that he's not getting out of jail. He's going to die. He says, the time of my departure is at hand. He knows he's going to die. And that tone is pervasive throughout the letter. So this is what happened. Paul was in prison in Rome. He got released. He was under house arrest, right? He writes a letter to Timothy. After he writes 1 Timothy, Titus, he gets released by Caesar Nero from prison. He's out of prison for about a year. We don't exactly know what happened to him, but we can piece some of the things together. He may have gone as far west as Spain in that year. That was his heart's desire, he wrote to the Romans. Remember? I want to visit you when I go to Spain. So he might have said, I'm going to Spain. I want to bring the message of Jesus Christ as far west as I can. I'm convinced if we would have existed as the United States 2,000 years ago, Paul would have wanted to come here. But he went perhaps to Spain. We know at least he went to Colossae. We know that he went to Ephesus, hung out with Timothy. He probably went to Crete to visit Titus. He helped Timothy a little bit while he was at Ephesus, but later on he was rearrested at Troas, brought back to Rome, put back in jail, this time a very different jail than the first time. First time house arrest, first time freedom for people to come in, come out. Second time, when he wrote 2 Timothy, he was in the Mamertine prison, locked down, solitary confinement, a hole in the ground. I visited the Mamertine prison twice now. And I've read through some of these sections in that pit just to to get what it was like. But these were the final days for Paul. They were dark days for Paul. Because 
And many people don't realize this about the apostle. When he writes 2 Timothy, most of Paul's best friends deserted him. You know, this wasn't going right. This whole Christianity thing wasn't going like they anticipated. Everybody's getting killed or hurt or arrested. Even Paul the Apostle was arrested, then re-arrested, and looks like he's going to die, and his friends deserted him. He's in a very, very dark place when he writes this letter. So, there's four chapters. Here's the outline. Chapter 1, the present calling. The present calling. Timothy, given what's going down, here's the calling on your life. That's chapter 1. Chapter 2, pastoral character. This is how you are to conduct yourself as a minister of God. Chapter 3, practical concern. And guess what that was? False doctrine, false teachers, people falling away from the truth. And chapter 4, a personal charge. Let's look at chapter 1, a few verses. The present calling. To Timothy, a beloved son, Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did. As without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, some of you are going, oh, I got it wrong. Others are going, yeah, I got it right because I cheated. No. Uh, (laughs) And I'm persuaded is also in you. So let's put the question up. Here it is. Who was the mother of Timothy? Was it? Okay, so, yeah. How many said Eunice? Well, let's see what it is. Do we have the results? Oh, look at that. 46% said Eunice, 5% Mary, 31% said Lydia. That's interesting. Uh, and uh, 18% said Lois. Lois was a grandmother, but hey, you guys are tracking. Way to go. Thank you very much for that poll. Pollsters, we appreciate that very much. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, verse 6, which is in you through the laying out of my hands. Let me, let me just fill in some gaps. It seems, as I read through First and Second Timothy, it seems that Timothy got discouraged easily or waned easily. At times got tough that he wasn't kind of up to the performance as a minister should be in difficult times that Paul thought. And he needed frequent encouragement and a, 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 in a exhortation to be faithful, to keep the fire alive. That's what stir up means, keep the fire burning, keep the, stole, the coal stoked. Verse 8, therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. What we notice here in this letter is that Paul recognizes that Timothy had a great spiritual upbringing, a mom and a grandmother who were believers, Jewish, believed in Yeshua, They probably got saved in Paul's first missionary journey. They were the instruments that led Timothy and exemplified the Christian faith to Timothy for him to make a decision. And that's a great blessing. Many of us are the spiritual victims of praying grandmothers and praying mothers. And keep those prayers coming. I love to see when women say, we're going to pray, it's like, yes, things are going to happen. I think of these women who prayed for Timothy, and Timothy was so valuable to Paul. You know, sometimes, today, when couples get together and they're going to have children, oftentimes, up to the point where they have kids, there's no thought about God or reading their Bible or going to church or a spiritual focus until they have children. Okay, now they have a child, and suddenly, it's like an epiphany. It's like, we got to go to church. we got to have a spiritual emphasis. Now, listen, I'm not knocking that or mocking that. I'm glad for that. At any time, any spiritual awakening is good. But what they're saying is, oh, goodness, my child's going to need spiritual guidance and moorings and a worldview that's worth something because I haven't been living that. But they need one. 
So though that's good at any time, let me suggest young couples who don't have children, do it before you have a child. Dedicate yourself to the Lord long before you have children because if it's just all about, I take my kids to church, they're going to see through that like in about two years when they have enough sense to talk and understand language and articulate. They're going to say, oh, hypocrisy. They take me to church, but they never live for God. A lot of times people will quote Proverbs 22, train up a child in the way that he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. I love what Abraham Lincoln said. He said, for a parent to train up a child in the way that he should go, he should go that way himself first. There was a, a group of scholars, four of them, four biblical translators, and they were all discussing what they thought was the best translation of the Bible. So the first guy said, oh, the old King James, that's so majestic, it's the best. Can't beat that. Another scholar said, I like the uh, NIV. It's a little more contemporary. It has some um, flavor and color to it that the King James misses. The third guy said, oh, I love the NASB. It's accurate. The fourth guy said, you know, my favorite and best translation of the New Testament is my parents' translation. And they looked at him and they laughed and they said, what do you mean? And he said, they translated every page of the Bible into their own life. And it was the most convincing Bible translation I have ever seen or heard. They lived it. They walked it. And so Timothy had this legacy of believing mother and grandmother. Look down at verse 15, chapter 1. This you know, that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are Phagellus and Hermogenes. Now, we don't know who they were. They probably were leaders who showed some promise as leaders, but they deserted their post. They ran away. They left. And so it, can you imagine being named by Paul? Because it's going to like, everybody's going to read it for like 2,000 more years. Your name's like doing that there for good. What a drag. It's something else. We find, it's not the only time he names names, Paul actually names people's names publicly. If somebody was false or an error, you know, they never kind of just soft step and go, well, you know, there are those who believe. He goes, I'll tell you who they are who believe. Here's their names. Stay away from them. And if you see them, rebuke them. We're very, very cautious to even get near any of that today. Uh, Paul saw that Poison must be labeled poison. And he did. Chapter 2 is the pastoral character. Now, we're just going to kind of quickly go through this because this is Paul being Mr. Metaphor. You're going to see all these mixed metaphors that uh, a leader is a steward, a soldier, an athlete, a farmer, and a workman. And you get it all in a few verses. Watch. Verse 3. You must therefore endure hardship as a good soldier... Of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. That's one metaphor. Here's another one. And if anyone competes in athletics, he's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. In verse 6, the hardworking farmer must be first to partake of his crops. Now, why does he do this? He's pulling out all these analogies to say, Sometimes serving God requires hard work. Hard work. All of these that are mentioned are hard-working people doing some hard-working tasks. So it takes daily determination and commitment, and anything worthwhile in life requires that. So verse 15, be diligent or be persistent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Be persistent, be diligent, work hard, hardworking farmer, athlete, soldier. See, all of that, he's saying, Timothy, you, you got to get back into the game, buddy. You can't wane now. you got to work hard, especially if you're a pastor, Timothy. Work hard, be diligent, be persistent. Several years ago, when he was alive, 
I had the privilege of having Dr. J. Vernon McGee speak here at a midweek Bible study at our church. And it was precious. I've always loved listening to him. I grew up listening to him. And I interviewed him that day on local radio. And J. Vernon McGee is known for taking his people through the whole Bible, verse by verse. Every day, that's what his broadcast, he goes through a book of the Bible. And we were talking about how rare that is. And I said, Dr. McGee, I, I need to ask you a question. Why is it, this is your legacy, you've taught through the whole Bible. I'm in my 20s when I'm interviewing him, and I'm just getting started in the ministry. I said, why is it that most churches and most pastors don't take their congregations from Genesis to Revelation like you have done through the whole Bible? And he said this on the radio, he said, because the lazy <laughs> uh, I tend to believe, friends, that we have a many lazy preachers. That's what he said. I'll never forget that. And that's exactly how he said it. Lazy preachers. So when he said that and he looked at me, I thought, I don't want to be a lazy preacher. I want to be diligent. I want to understand the text. I want to understand the context. I want to know the language. I want to know the history and be as accurate. And notice... Rightly dividing, it means to cut a straight line. That's what it means, cutting a straight line. Now, what was Paul by occupation? He was a tent maker. And they made tents in those days, not with cloth, but skins of animals. And it required exactness in cutting the skin straight to bring the ends together. That's the analogy he's using. Also, it was used when roads were put in and you had to cut a straight line through a valley or a straight path through a field. And what Paul is saying here, given that language and this analogy, is this. Timothy, build a straight road through the field of truth and don't get sidetracked. That's the idea of this verse. Build a straight road through the field of truth and don't get sidetracked. Preach the word. So that takes us to chapter 3 and 4. Chapter 3 is the practical concern. And you know what? I've discovered that Paul's concern should be our concern. It's the same issues today. People deviate from truth and call themselves Christian churches. Verse 1, but know this, in the last days perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness and denying its power. And from such people turn away. Boy, you'd think he just read the local newspaper <laughs> coming up with this list. It's amazing that only 30 years after the gospel through Christ and the original apostles exploded in Jerusalem, a mere 30 years later, there was already at that time a falling away from the truth, a falling away from what is right, a falling away from Christ. It's always been the case. Satan has always wanted to question truth from the very beginning. What did he say to Adam and Eve? Half God said, came the question, a challenge to God's truth. Even Jesus said something that Every time I read, I get a lump in my throat. He said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find the faith on the earth? A very haunting question. Well, this is what it means. If indeed the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth, which it said so in 1 Timothy, it is. This is where truth, real truth, is disseminated. It makes sense that the church will become the battleground. That just makes sense in simple strategy. And that's true. That's why liberalism in the church doesn't surprise us. That's why attacks from the cults don't surprise us. That's why church splits and church attacks don't surprise us because the church, according to the Bible, is ground zero. It's ground zero. Satan is always on the prowl seeking whom he may devour. And 
my big concern is people in the church because I'm a pastor. Every time I read anything at all by this group, the World Council of Churches, I shudder. I wish they'd change their name to World Eclectic False Doctrine something because <laughs> they never say anything worthwhile at all. Now, the World Council of Churches has a uh, comprise of 350 churches in 120 different countries that would effectively touch the possibility of 550 million people. Recently, World Council of Churches, uh, 25 theologians got together in Switzerland and put out this statement, quote, all religious traditions are ambiguous. In other words, they're a combination of good and bad. And, quote, listen to this, we need to move beyond a theology which confines salvation to the explicit personal commitment of Jesus Christ. So, you heard that. I recommend that you do what Paul just said. From such, turn away. Turn away. Have nothing to do. Turn away. Takes us to chapter 4. And we'll close with this. The personal charge. Verse 2. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and will turn their ears away from the truth, be turned aside to fables. Sound doctrine. Hugiano means literally hygienic doctrine. Clean, healthy teaching. Why would anyone ever turn away from good, solid, healthy Bible teaching? I can tell you exactly why. Because it rebukes their ungodliness. And Jesus said, men love darkness rather than what? Light, because their deeds were evil. That's exactly why it happens. You can couch it under, well, my belief system is, but it's just simply an accommodation to their own behavior. Verse 5, but you, Timothy, but you, in contrast to that, but you, be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Okay, here it is. This is his parting words, verse 6. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure, the word departure speaks of a ship setting sail from the harbor, is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Timothy, finish well. Because Timothy, look at me. This is what Paul is saying. Look at me, Timothy. I'm finishing well. Time of my departure is at hand. But I've run the race. Timothy, I finished the course. So Timothy, stay at it. It's so... I can't think of a word. It's that bad of whatever word you want to use, to see a life that is lived and lived and lived, and then at the end, the finish is poor. One of the great things I've always admired and still do, especially as Dr. Billy Graham is nearing his own, the end of his life. He won't be with us much longer. He's very frail. I was invited to be at George Beverly Shea's 100th birthday party next week, or a couple weeks, I won't be able to make that, but... Here's Dr. Billy Graham and George Beverly Shea, and they're finishing well. They're going to heaven the right way. They're finishing their course. So these were among the last words of Paul. Verse 22, the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. His last words. His last words. I've often wondered... What will my last words be? I hope they're good words. I hope it's not like you say something really lame to your wife and then you get in a car accident and that's the last words. These are Paul's last words. He, he preached to the very end. The last sound I ever want to hear is the sound of my chin hitting the pulpit as I go down. That's how I want to finish. Now, 
This is the end of Paul's life. After he finished writing this, not very long afterwards, he was taken to a place called the Basilica Julia, a big building in Rome that was built by Julius Caesar. And there Paul the Apostle stood before some representative of the Roman government and he heard the death sentence against him. And after that, Paul marched out to his death. I'm borrowing now and closing with this from A.T. Robertson. The crowds flowed into town. Some were going out. Paul was only a criminal going to be beheaded. Few, if any, of the crowds knew about or cared anything about him. At a good place on the road, some miles out, the executioner stopped. The block was laid down. The executioner stood ready, axe in hand. The men stripped Paul, tied him, kneeling upright to a low pillar which exposed his back and his neck. The lectors beat him with rods for the last time. He groaned and bled from his nose and his mouth. And then, without a hint of hesitation, the executioner frowned as he swung the blade down swiftly, hitting its mark with a dull thud. And the head of the greatest preacher of the ages rolled upon the ground. In that brutal moment, Paul the Apostle went from the imperial city of Rome to the celestial city of heaven. And he was crowned and he received the reward that he wrote about in these last words. I'm so impressed with the life of Paul the Apostle. I've studied him. I've been on places and traveled places and taken people where he's been. Love his life. I'm convicted by Paul. I thank God for him. Heavenly Father, as we have heard the last will and testimony of a great man of faith, one who never flinched, did get discouraged, but got back up, threat, whip, shipwreck, prison, hardship of the journey, did not stay him, but he moved forward, always in your will, always believing there was somebody else who needed to hear, and another church that needed to be encouraged, edified, instructed. And he left us with quite a legacy of a man who ran the race, finished the course. And Father, we just think of our own life and do pray that by your spirit, by your grace, you'd keep us. We have that wonderful promise that he who has begun a good work will continue to perform it until the day of Christ. Thank you for a faithful flock. Keep us all serving, following, in Jesus' name. Amen.